Hello there, I'm Toby Haydoke, and she has seen the truth and is beyond our control. Welcome to Too Much Information, which aims to tell you the who, what and when of Doctor Who, a television programme about shunning the temptations of false fantasies and finding contentment in the way things really are. Whether you're discovering the episodes for the very first time, or you know your morpho brains from your totter's lanes, then you're extremely welcome on this odyssey behind the scenes, which aims to go through the series one episode at a time. In this edition, it's an episode which features not a single setting, supporting character or monster from last week. Even the genre has changed. Yet nonetheless, continues the story of the Time Traveller's search for the keys to the conscience of Marinus. So join me, Toby Haydock, as I give you the who, what and when of Doctor Who, the Velvet Web, or Mighty Morpho Power Brainers. First broadcast on the 18th of April, 1964, at 5.31pm. It starred William Hartnell as Doctor Who, William Russell as Ian Chesterton, Jacqueline Hill as Barbara Wright, and Carol Ann Ford as Susan Foreman, with guest star Robin Phillips as Altos, and introducing Catherine Schofield as Sabitha. It was written by Terry Nation, produced by Verity Lambert, and directed by John Gorry. It was watched by 9.4 million people, and the audience appreciation was 60. Having discovered Barbara's abandoned travel dial, the Doctor, Ian and Susan are relieved to find her not only safe and sound, but being treated royally by the people of Morphoton. The city's leader, Altos, offers them anything their hearts desire. Fine food, gorgeous garments, even a sophisticated science lab. In the night, a strange force overcomes the travellers, augmented by a device placed on their foreheads. Barbara's device falls off and when she awakens, she sees through the illusion. The food is filthy and the garments are rags. But her friends cannot be persuaded and soon Barbara is being hunted on the orders of mutated brains with eyes on stalks, the real rulers of Morphoton. When? 3rd of February 1964. With Teddy Nation having thus far sketched only the first instalment of The Keys of Marinus, he meets with story editor David Whittaker in his London flat to flesh out more of the adventure. For episode two, they collaborate on the notion of a city which seems to fulfil its residents' every desire. By the time Whittaker departs, agreement has been reached on the cast and design requirements for episode two, and it has been confirmed that no pre-filming will be necessary. 11th of February 1964. Terry Nation completes his draft script for episode two, which now bears the title The Velvet Web. 13th of February 1964. Donald Bavistock, the controller of BBC One, grants permission for the four Doctor Who regulars to be contracted for a full 52-week run. However, it is not feasible for the actors to work week in, week out for an entire year without a break. Plans begin to coalesce around a sequence of two-week holidays, carefully spaced so that they happen in the midst of stories when the actor's absence can be covered by either appropriate plot developments or a limited amount of pre-filming. It is eventually agreed that William Hartnell will be the first cast member released for his vacation, to take place during the weeks that episodes three and four of The Keys of Marinus are being rehearsed and recorded. The Doctor will be completely written out of these scripts, so the Velvet Web also has to be amended to set up the notion that the Doctor will jump ahead to the location of the fifth and final key, and therefore will not participate in the search for keys three and four. To provide an additional protagonist who can assume some of the Doctor's role in the third and fourth episodes, it's decided that Altos, a character originally devised for only the Velvet Web, will now appear throughout the rest of the Keys of Marinus. The rewrites are performed by David Whittaker. We can't be sure exactly when he undertakes the corresponding revisions to the Velvet Web, 
but his new version of episode 4, The Snows of Terror, is dated March the 17th, so it's likely that episode 2's amendments are made around the same time, less than a week in advance of rehearsals. 23rd of March, 1964. Those rehearsals begin at the Territorial Army Drill Hall on Uxbridge Road and run through to the 26th. Joining the cast are Catherine Schofield as Sabitha and Robin Phillips as Altos. Both have been cast by director John Gorry in part because they suit his vision of Sabitha and Altos as being akin to a fairy tale princess and her prince. Schofield has been a student of Gorry's when he taught at the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art, while Scorry and Phillips had acted together at the Bristol Old Vic in 1960-61 on plays such as The Goat Song and George Bernard Shaw's Caesar and Cleopatra. In fact, Caesar and Cleopatra boasted the talents of a number of future Doctor Who contributors, including cyber controller Michael Kilgariff, Annette Crosby, Mrs Angelo in The Eleventh Hour, Peter Biddle, the draconian prince in Frontier in Space, Julian Fox, Peter Hamilton in Death to the Daleks, and Mark Heath, Ralph, in the Moonbase. But of greatest significance to the Velvet Web is that it reunites not just Gorry and Phillips, but also the designer of Caesar and Cleopatra, Daphne Dare. She is now designing costumes for The Keys of Marinus, as indeed she will continue to do for many other Doctor Who stories. And this also continues a very fruitful relationship with Robin Phillips, as we shall discover later. 27th of March, 1964. The Velvet Web is recorded in Lime Grove Studio D. The day follows the same schedule that we discussed last episode for The Sea of Death, so I won't repeat it here. But this time around, with the final scene in the can circa 9.45pm, William Hartnell departs for his fortnight's holiday. He won't return to work until the start of rehearsals on episode 5, Sentence of Death, on the 13th of April. 31st of March, 1964. Editing begins on the Velvet Web between 6.30 and 9.30pm. By the standards of 1964, it's a complex production, with several sequences having been recorded out of order, as we'll discover. 2nd of April, 1964. Another editing session is held between 6.30 and 9.30pm to finish work on the Velvet Web. 18th of April, 1964. At 5.31pm, one minute later than scheduled, the Velvet Web is broadcast. This makes it the very last Doctor Who episode to be transmitted on BBC Television. Yes, that's right, but that's BBC Television the channel, not BBC Television as an entity. Heavens no, may that dark day never come. But the channel currently called BBC Television is about to be rebranded because on April the 21st, BBC Two will make its debut, reshaping the small screen landscape and prompting BBC Television to be known henceforth as BBC One. Having lost half a million viewers last week with The Sea of Death, Doctor Who sees another half million tune out for The Velvet Web, bringing its audience down to 9.4 million. In terms of chart position, this is enough to cost the programme three places, from 22nd to 25th. The audience appreciation figure sees a little dip too, dropping a couple of points to 60, though that's still better than the last few episodes of Marco Polo. 21st of September 2009. This is the date of the release of The Keys of Marinus on DVD, which means that it is also the first date since its original broadcast that the Velvet Web can be seen at its full original running time. During preparation for this DVD release, Richard Molesworth, putting together his production subtitles, has noticed a missing line from episode 2 which tallies with an awkward on-screen cut. He has raised this with picture restorer Peter Crocker, who subsequently has discovered a difference of a few seconds between the running time of the negative and the duration logged on the BBC's PSB transmission forms from 1964. After careful study, he has identified four possible physical splices in the Velvet Web, plus a further three on a later episode which will cover on the Snows of Terror. Further examination has revealed a fifth during Fade to Black, which Crocker would never have been able to pick up with the naked eye. Oddly, these cuts appear to have occurred before any sales prints were struck. The missing bits were missing on the Australian broadcast, for example, and were therefore made sometime shortly after transmission. Those from the Velvet Web 
were 70, 55, 24, 35 and 20 frames. So a total of seven seconds of cuts to episode two, which Peter Crocker has covered with cutaways, composites and image manipulation in order to return the episode to its original running time for the first time since 1964. The what? Viewers of latter-day Doctor Who will be used to the title of the story appearing over the opening credit sequence, but this is the first time it ever happens, right here, at the start of The Velvet Web. This is such an evocative title that, 33 years later, it would be borrowed by Christopher Summerisle for an erotic novel. It seems a missed opportunity that this Velvet Web wasn't followed by a sequel or two which also pilfered Terry Nation episode titles for their <clears throat> strap lines. One can only imagine the prurient opportunities offered by, say, Golden Death, that's your kind of thing, or The Screaming Jungle. Oh my. Christopher Summer Isle, incidentally, would go on to write for Doctor Who itself a decade later, providing scripts such as The Shakespeare Code and The Lodger under his real name, Gareth Roberts. What follows this first-ever title-over-title sequence malarkey is a new version of the scene which provided the cliffhanger to the Sea of Death last week. Here, William Hartnell flubs his first line of the episode. Instead of saying, I can't imagine that Barbara would have left here of her own free will, he instead utters, I can't imagine why Barbara left of her own free will, which doesn't really make sense in context. But, well, don't we all get distracted at work when we're just minutes away from clocking off for a couple of weeks? As the party moves towards what's described as impressive double doors, the camera script indicates that the Doctor should take Ian by the arm. William Hartnell vaguely wafts his hands in the direction of William Russell's arm, but doesn't quite manage to connect. The end of Ian's response to the Doctor is different in the script. We haven't time for finesse, he says. She may need help now. On screen, this becomes, We can't argue now. Let's get inside. The action as the travellers pass through the doors is more protracted in the camera script. After Ian pushes the doors, they swing open and the time travellers enter. Only after they peer about at their surroundings are they engulfed in a great flood of blindingly bright light. A long shot of the bank of lights would have depicted them as they flare and dim in rhythmic pattern. Then there was to be a cut back to the Doctor, Ian and Susan, who appear to suffer physical pain from both lights and sound. Presumably, the action is simplified to avoid a potential plot hole. If the viewer were to be given a glimpse of the room before the brainwashing device is activated, they should have perceived it in its genuine, ruined state. Once the lights fade, the script states that the surrounding should be a room of great splendour. It equals the glory of ancient Rome. Barbara's warm welcome to Ian and Susan, but not to the Doctor, is exactly as scripted. Fear may make companions of us all, but friendship, it seems, takes a little longer to develop. As scripted, Barbara's subsequent explanation for the blood on her travel dial specified that it was the buckle that must have scratched her. When the Doctor declares that it's all most remarkable... William Hartnell seems to have jumped his cue. In the camera script, this line comes after the serving women have brought in vast platters laden with gastronomic fantasies. Well, as vast and fantastic as can be accommodated on a BBC budget, anyhow. After Barbara proclaims the food to be magnificent, William Russell ad-libs Ian's It certainly is. When Barbara describes having met their host, it hammers home just how much has happened to her since she arrived in Morphoton losing her travel dial, passing through the double doors, encountering Altos, ordering and donning her new clothes, and then setting herself down to enjoy a snack. Certainly this is far more than can have taken place in a handful of minutes since she disappeared from Arbitan's pyramid in the Sea of Death, given that the Doctor, Ian and Susan hardly dallied there after she vanished. This might be construed as evidence of Barbara's mental manipulation, with no other unprocessed individuals present, perhaps there was no need to provide the illusion of time passing while her new dress was fabricated. But maybe it's also a result of Barbara tearing the travel dial off her wrist, technology that, in the Sea of Death, Arbiton compared with the TARDIS. While he suggested that the travel dial allows movement only through space and not through time, perhaps Barbara caused it to malfunction. 
if she inadvertently triggered a slight temporal displacement, the result might have been her premature arrival in Morphoton, say, an hour before her friends. Speaking of their host, Altos, he's described in the script as young, tall and good-looking. The only subnormality is his eyes. They tend to move slowly, stare and remain unblinking. As mentioned in the when above, like many early Doctor Who episodes, the Velvet Web survives in the form of a 16mm film print rather than the original 2-inch videotape. Unfortunately, one of those missing segments to this 16mm print mentioned above occurs where the print has been spliced around Susan's exclamation Do you mean you can do anything you want? which was therefore missing from every subsequent broadcast and release of the story until the DVD. Fortunately, off-air audio recordings have preserved these few lost seconds. The DVD version, now available as part of the Hooniverse on iPlayer, marries it to a cutaway shot of the Doctor, Ian and Barbara, with Ian's head replaced and at a different angle from elsewhere in the episode to compensate for the missing visual. There are a few differences between the script's description of what happens after the time travellers fall asleep and how it's portrayed on screen. Terry Nation had intended for the carved plaque on the wall to slide back, revealing huge, unwinking, frog-like eyes in the darkness of the recess. This is simplified to have the eyes of the carving light up instead. The final realisation of the prop still differs from what designer Raymond P. Cusick had in mind. His original request to freelance builder Shawcraft was for a pair of four-inch bloodshot eyeballs, rather more grotesque than what was ultimately manufactured. The sound which accompanies the more permanent form of brainwashing, later referred to as the mesmeron, was to be a panting and wheezing noise, rather than the heartbeat effect which is ultimately used. In the camera script, Sabitha's entrance isn't a continuous part of the action, but instead takes place later in the night as a new scene. On the page, Barbara is not woken by the disc falling from her head. Instead, she simply opens her eyes and takes the disc from her head, examines it. She is baffled. When Barbara is writhing in pain from the lights and sounds which assault her, the script indicates that she tries to reach out a hand to wake Susan, who sleeps peacefully. Jacqueline Hill seems to follow this stage direction, but the framing of the shot makes it unclear what she's reaching for. It could just as easily be the fallen disc. The episode's first recording break follows Barbara's collapse back into sleep, allowing the cast to reposition themselves and the lighting to be adjusted for the morning hours. In the breakfast scene, the beverage Susan is drinking is simply fruit juice in the script, but Caroline Ford opts for the more specific orange juice. The script indicates that camera two should keep Ian in shot as the sleeping Barbara is brought into the foreground. Instead, the pan loses William Russell so that the viewer is initially left in the dark when the doctor asks about Ian rubbing his forehead. In the script, the audience is meant to see the gesture before the doctor notices it. When Susan asks if she can rouse Barbara, she is meant to add, I'm sure she won't mind. A second recording break comes as Barbara awakens, allowing the cast to move over to what the script refers to as Reception Room Reality, whereas the opulent version is henceforth known as Reception Room Fantasy. Its walls are dank and dripping, writes Terry Nation. The rich drapes are ragged hessian. The expensive furniture is rough boards. The food and drink on the table are scraps. The dress on Susan's arm is a bundle of rags. Everywhere there is filth and squalor where before there was beauty and richness. The only things unchanged are the physical dimensions of the room and the positions of the things in it. They're represented by two similar but different sets in the studio. Raymond Cusick wanted to make the reality environment even more repulsive by including some stuffed rats, but John Gorry vetoed their inclusion. This wasn't the only dispute Cusick had over the Velvet Web. He was also taken to task for the expense of the furnishings hired for the fantasy set. This scene, scene 8, is unusually complicated by the standards of 1964 television. To capture the intercutting between reality and fantasy, shots 38, 39, 41, 43 and 45 are taped together on the reality set. There's then a recording break 
after which shots 40, 42, 44 and 46, all of which adopt the perspective of the fantasy reception room, precede a fourth recording break. It has to be acknowledged that too much information is diverging from several of our sources in our account of how these shots were achieved. Several references suggest that Jacqueline Hill stayed on the fantasy set, while William Hartnell, William Russell and Carol Ann Ford moved over to the reality set. And that would make a certain amount of sense if shots 38 and 46 were being recorded in narrative order. But since we know that this part of the studio schedule was actually grouped by set, splitting the actors wouldn't achieve much at all. Furthermore, Barbara's hand can be seen striking the cup in shot 38. If that's not Jacqueline Hill's hand, then whose is it? And why spend money on a superfluous extra? Likewise, William Hartnell and William Russell are clearly standing on the fantasy set in shots 40 and 46. On top of all that, Robin Phillips is present on both sets in shots 43, 45 and 46. So with the greatest respect to those esteemed giants of research who have preceded us, we're pretty confident that they've got this one wrong. But we certainly won't hold it against them. After all, as we can see, fantasy and reality are not always easy to tell apart. Speaking of Barbara knocking the cup out of the Doctor's grasp, Jacqueline Hill comes in early for her assertion that it was just a filthy old mug. The Doctor's line is truncated as a result. Originally, he was to say of the cup, This must be one of a set, young lady. That was very careless of you. Mind you, it sounds as if William Hartnell is about to deliver an altogether different rebuke before he's cut off, and he's already altered the dialogue to make it sound as if the Doctor somehow knows that the mug is part of a set, rather than this being something that he's inferred. One scripted stage direction that would not have aged well had it actually been filmed comes after Barbara first insists that everything has changed. Instead of just gently shaking her, Ian braces himself, then slaps her hard across the face. She gasps, but it steadies her a little. We aren't sure what's worse here, Ian getting physical at the first sign of a little hysteria, or the implication that it actually has the desired effect. When Altos appears, Robin Phillips is wearing a ragged version of the exquisite robes in which he had earlier been dressed. As with Sabitha later in the episode, Daphne Dare designs both the fantasy and reality outfits to be reminiscent of each other. Stage direction suggests that Altos's face registers concern and anger as he sees Barbara. After Barbara realises that Altos knows she's no longer affected by the brainwashing, there's another tape splice when the shot returns to Altos. The missing seconds were recreated by computer for the DVD edition of The Keys of Marius, and eagle-eyed viewers might spot a slight undulation in the picture and Altos's position as he approaches Barbara. Stage directions indicate that Barbara should back away from him, but this isn't reflected on screen. The recording break, which comes after the completion of the fantasy sequences, allows Jacqueline Hill to change into a ruined version of her dress, and then move over to the cellar set. Her running footsteps are provided by the Grams operator, Pat Hyam. Another tape splice impacts the start of this scene, but the static nature of the visual means that the DVD release could repair the damage simply by adding the sound of Barbara's footfalls to a frozen image of the cellar. Barbara successfully hiding from Altos around the side of a thin column may strain credulity, particularly to modern viewers, but it's pretty much exactly what Terry Nation envisions. She flings herself against the wall, hoping she is out of sight. The room holding the four brains, called Morphos in the script, is dubbed the Control Room. Terry Nation suggests that their glass domes should be similar to Victorian display cases. They're meant to pulsate in time to the wheezing noise heard earlier. Although, as with that previous scene, a heartbeat sound effect takes its place. The morphos are lit from below and appear to glow from within. Of the voice, in the production provided by Heron Carvick, Nation indicates that it should be a breathless creak and we cannot see where it emanates. The brains are another Shawcraft construction, and in fact, they fabricate one more than the quartet ultimately used in the episode, presumably a backup in case a second take is required for the sequence in which Barbara attacks the Morphos. 
When Sabitha is thrown into the cellar with Barbara, the history teacher is suddenly much more knowledgeable about what has transpired, to the extent that she is able to immediately recognise her new companion as the girl who put the discs on their foreheads. Had she remembered the discs upon awakening, it might be expected that she would have described them to her friends. Indeed, her own disc is presumably still lying on the floor where it fell. Perhaps, isolated and trapped, she's had a chance to dredge up memories of the previous night. Perhaps. In addition to a ragged version of her dress, Sabitha now sports a different hairstyle, emphasising her new status as an outcast amongst the servants of Morphaton. Jacqueline Hill stumbles over her attempt to get through to Sabitha. She's meant to say that she believes that Sabitha is under some form of deep hypnosis, but she accidentally invokes the word deep too early, winding up with some deep form of deep hypnosis. Which isn't wrong. In the scene where Altos leads the Doctor and Ian to the Erzatz laboratory, there is another one of those invisible fixes. Once again, we are lucky that whatever damage occurred and was removed here happened on a static shot of the door before Ian, Altos and the Doctor arrive, which means it could be returned to the right length and fixed fairly straightforwardly. In the scene proper, the audience glimpses the truth about the room earlier than Terry Nation intended. He indicates that it should first be depicted via a photo caption of a vast laboratory equipped with fantastic apparatus. Only when the Doctor and Ian enter is it revealed to be a tiny room, bare but for a single rough table, on which are a few cups and plates. When Sabitha is revealed to possess one of the titular keys of Marinus, the script says that she strokes the key circuit like a scolded child taking comfort in a treasured toy. Several lines of dialogue are omitted after Barbara first asks whether Sabitha recognises the name Arbiter. Barbara goes on to probe her memory of an island surrounded by a sea of acid and the building on the island which contained four keys similar to this one before circling back to Arbiton as the man who controlled these keys. It's only at this point that the first flicker of emotion crosses her face. The subsequent action is more visceral in the script. The effort of memory is too great for Sabitha. It causes physical pain. Barbara takes hold of her, dominating her mentally. Back in the control room, when the Morpho orders its slave to open the panel, stage directions indicate that a rectangular panel opens in the wall. One of the brains is in a position to see through it. This suggests that the control room is meant to physically share a wall with the recreation room, presumably the same wall on which hangs the carved plaque. When the Morpho describes Altos placing the Somnor discs on the Doctor, Ian and Susan, the script notes that we should see this action from the brain's point of view. The second sentence is lost from the Morpho's subsequent speech, describing how the time traveller's wills are weakening. Their acceptance of the health and safety of the escaped woman proves that, it was to say. As a result, the concluding statement that they shall remember her no more feels slightly orphaned since there's now no previous mention of Barbara in the scene. Also cut is part of the Morpho's instructions to Altos regarding Barbara. After ordering a search at first light, it says, Everyone not on essential work must be put on this as priority. Get the new ones to help. It will prove an interesting final test to their subjection. Oddly, the script includes two versions of this speech and Altos's preceding inquiry. The second version is even shorter than what ultimately makes it to the screen, lacking both the assignment of finding Barbara as Altos's responsibility and the warning that he will be killed if he fails in his task. When the story returns to Barbara's efforts to deprogram Sabitha, or to dominate her, as Terry Nation insists on describing it, the on-screen action differs slightly between script and screen. On the page, Sabitha is beyond the effort. She pulls away from Barbara. And then she moans, I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm so tired. As recorded, Sabitha instead collapses into Barbara, and her line is, I can't remember anymore. I feel so sleepy. The next stage direction tells us, Barbara knows she can get no more from the girl. Her own exhaustion starts to overtake her. 
When Altos returns for Sabitha, the camera loses Barbara for longer than the script intends. We are supposed to see that, behind him, Barbara rises from her hiding place. Very carefully and silently, she moves towards the stairs. Her eyes on Altos, she trips. This is the sound we hear that alerts Altos to her presence. The staging of the ensuing struggle also changes from page to performance. In the transmitted episode, Altos takes a strip of cloth from his garments and it looks like he's trying to wrap it around Barbara's neck to choke her when Sabitha brains him with the stool. In the script, however, Altos draws a knife from the folds of his clothes, raises it to strike. Barbara grabs his wrist. His greater strength forces the knife towards Barbara. Then, as the blade touches her throat, there is a crash. Altos falls unconscious. Standing behind him, the small stool in her hand is Sabitha. When Barbara learns that the Morphos are creatures whose brains outgrew their bodies, their response to her accusation that they're treating people like machines may sound familiar to keen readers of Isaac Asimov's 1954 novel The Caves of Steel. As Jonathan Morris points out in his Fact of Fiction article for Doctor Who magazine, the Morphos dialogue about human flexibility bears a close resemblance to the explanation offered by Asimov's roboticist, Dr Anthony Gerigal, for the advantages inherent in the human form, which can do a great many widely various things. Notably, Morris observes that Terry Nation is adapting The Caves of Steel for television at around the same time that he is writing The Keys of Marinus. It is broadcast on the 5th of June 1964 as part of BBC Two's Story Parade, less than three weeks after The Keys of Marinus ends. It stars soon-to-be big-screen Doctor Who, Peter Cushing, and John Carson, Ambril from Snake Dance, with supporting roles for the likes of Richard Beale, whose four Doctor Who stories include The Gunfighters, for which he played Bat Masterson, and Patsy Smart, the ghoul, from the talons of Wang Chiang. The control room device that Barbara damages is described in the script as the apparatus that feeds the brains. Masses of rubber tubes run to the bases of the containers. The purpose of the conveniently placed heavy metal jug is not specified. Raymond Cusick had intended the feeding apparatus to be more dynamic with moving parts as opposed to the static prop which Shawcraft ultimately delivers. Terry Nation indicates that Barbara should smash all four of the brain jars although she only shatters the first container on screen, facilitated by the use of sugar glass in its construction, which is much more brittle than regular glass. Indeed, it doesn't look like Jacqueline Hill is even trying to hit the other three containers, presumably because only one backup morpho has been fabricated. At the end of this scene, there is a fade to black, which is afflicted by the final bit of damage removal, which has again now been restored to its proper length, but aren't we lucky that three out of these five occurrences happened on such easily covered moments? In two episodes' time, we will not be quite so lucky. This fade was introduced originally to cover the episode's fifth recording break, providing time to set up the lighting effects which evoke the riot-gripping Morphoton, and for Jacqueline Hill to change back into the outfit she wore in The Sea of Death. Unlike in the first episode, no special effects are required for Susan's use of the travel dial. A quick cut from camera three to camera one and back gives Caroline Ford time to step out of shot. The other actors' reactions do the rest of the work. The script specifies another fade to black after the Doctor instructs his friends to follow Susan, although none appears in the transmitted episode. Again, this was meant to coincide with the recording break, the sixth and last of the episode, as both Caroline Ford and Camera One position themselves on the set for what Terry Nation describes as a crumbling city wall near a dark archway. Huge carved statues lie about on the ground. Raymond Cusick's design, however, provides no indication that this is anything other than an isolated ruin. Having arrived at her destination, stage directions suggest that Susan should initially be surrounded by a dead silence. Only then does the whispering noise begin and increases quickly, reaching a crescendo as Susan sinks to the ground. The blending of the strange noises with the closing theme music follows a scripted instruction. The Who Robin Phillips 
Robin Phillips, playing Altos in The Velvet Web and for the rest of the story's episodes, was born on the 28th of February 1940 in Hazelmere, Surrey. He came from a very working class background. He was the son of a gardener and a housekeeper, both of whom worked for the film star Stuart Granger and his wife, actress Elspeth March. Among Robin's earliest memories was being carried about aloft on Granger's shoulders. He was a smart boy and so studied at Midhurst Grammar School, but he struggled with the formal educational environment, instead burying himself in the library and being his own teacher as he soaked up its literature. At just 15, he began working for the famous theatrical costumiers Bermans and Nathans before enrolling to study acting, design and directing at the Bristol Old Vic Theatre School. Patrick Stewart was a contemporary making his professional acting debut with the company in 1959, with roles including Romeo in Romeo and Juliet and Constantine in Chekhov's The Seagull. He also worked as an assistant director to John Hale. Their production of jean Louis' The Rehearsal transferred to the West End in 1961. But he could easily have settled for the life of an actor. He'd started work on the small screen in 1962, including a role in an ITV playhouse directed by Hale. And Doctor Who was a relatively early break, probably his most substantial on-screen role to that date. From those foundations, though, he became busy on television. He did Constantine again, this time for Theatre 625 in 1966, and then he played Posh opposite comedian Jimmy Edwards in the series Mr John Jorrocks, 1966. He appeared in four episodes of the classic The Foresight Saga as a shell-shocked war veteran in 1967, and he was the lead in 1969's big TV adaptation of David Copperfield, which also featured Laurence Olivier, Richard Attenborough, Edith Evans and many more heavyweights. Oscar-winning American Delbert Mann was at the helm. His other fantasy work included the Avengers episode A Sense of History in 1966, the same year that he did Out of the Unknown's Second Childhood. But a solid, potentially impressive television career, he had not only the ability but arresting, moody, yet beguiling good looks, had to take a back seat because of his great success in the theatre. And his inability to act without making myriad suggestions to his colleagues about their work. He directed the first ever modern dress production attempted by the Royal Shakespeare Company with 1970's Two Gentlemen of Verona, a woozy production, all cocktails and sunglasses, and set by a swimming pool, which featured Patrick Stewart, Ian Richardson and Helen Mirren. That same year, a production of his, Abelard and Heloise, starring Diana Rigg and Keith Michel, with a daring and much-talked-about nude scene, transferred from London to Broadway. He was artistic director of the Greenwich Theatre from 1973 to 1975, where he teamed up with designer Daphne Dare, who had, of course, worked with him on Doctor Who, who became his major collaborator. Whilst there, his collaboration with his friends and influences Ned Sherin and Carol Brahms took him to the West End again, with Barbara Windsor starring in his production of Singer Root Song. Having gathered momentum, he surged towards the big change in his life he was offered the chance to become the artistic director of the hugely respected Stratford Festival in Canada in 1975. He leapt at the offer. Having struggled with England's class system in a theatre world dominated by Oxbridge types, he was made to feel like an uneducated interloper from a rural backwater by the Swiss metropolitans who held power. That said, when he arrived in Canada, there was much resistance this time from nationalists who didn't want an English wunderkind throwing his weight about in the country's prime theatrical establishment. But he won them over by going back to basics, throwing out the pomp, casting aside the Englishness. He had encountered a number of Canadians whilst at Bristol and felt that the accent had potential to be the best carrier for Shakespeare's verse and freed Stratford's actors up by not insisting they adopt plummy UK RP tones. This was revolutionary and welcomed. He directed 36 productions there in six seasons, increasing the audience, growing the company and advancing the reputation of the organisation as he did so. 
Under him, it became the premier classical theatre of North America and achieved worldwide renown. Whilst there, he attracted some big stars to lead his company of exciting young Canadian actors, including Jessica Tandy, Peter Ustinov and Maggie Smith, who played Lady Macbeth, Cleopatra and As You Like It's Rosalind for Phillips, whose productions were lauded by the top critics of the time. His classical stagings were beautiful and precise, with unfussy scenery, gorgeous costumes and much attention given to the acting, though Phillips involved himself with every small detail of each production. He was not uncontroversial and could even be brutal in the rehearsal room, but he taught many performers important lessons that would hold them in good stead, and his precision meant that his renditions of texts had what has been described as crystalline clarity. He was also known for the playful environment of his rehearsal rooms and for his infectious laugh. Theatre to me is a vocation, Philip said in 2002. I believe that we do it for reasons other than just to entertain and that if we do it well, we can make a huge difference to people's lives. He resigned from his post during the 1980 season, citing exhaustion. He had briefly returned to the London stage directing Maggie Smith in a Stratford production that transferred to the Haymarket, Edna O'Brien's much-lauded Virginia, about Virginia Woolf, and then would later become artistic director of the Grand Theatre in London, Ontario, and return to Stratford to direct the Young Company, which he had established in 1987-88. The artistic director now was another UK emigre with a sci-fi link, the X-Files actor John Neville. He also was Director General of the Citadel Theatre in Edmonton from 1990 to 1995 and helped to found the Toronto-based Soul Pepper Theatre at the end of the decade. Whilst at the Citadel, he launched a US tour of Andrew Lloyd Webber's Aspects of Love and followed that with a four-year Broadway run from 1997 of a musical Jekyll and Hyde, winning the Drama Desk Award for Outstanding Set Design for his contribution to the scenery. This led to a West End recall, courtesy of Bill Kenwright, and he directed revivals of Eugene O'Neill's Long Day's Journey Into Night with Jessica Lang and Charles Dance at the Lyric on Shaftesbury Avenue in 2000, and of Ibsen's Ghosts with Francesca Annis, Martin Hudson and Anthony Andrews at the Comedy Theatre in 2001. Robin Phillips was appointed an Officer of the Order of Canada in 2005. The citation read in part... Robin Phillips is revered amongst members of Canada's acting community. A tremendous asset to the cultural life of Canada, he is also credited with bringing new life to the Citadel Theatre in Edmonton and to theatres across the country. In 2010, Phillips received the Governor-General's Performing Arts Award for Lifetime Artistic Achievement, Canada's highest honour in the performing arts. He died in his sleep, aged 75, on the 25th of July 2015, after a prolonged illness. He had had quadruple bypass surgery and he suffered from diabetes. He featured posthumously in the documentary Robin and Mark and Richard III, designed by former collaborators Susan Coyne and Martha Burns to capture some of his directing technique. He was survived by a younger sister, Hilary, and by his partner, Joe Mandel, whom he first met in 1962, but who became his partner in 1971. They spent much of their life together, living on a farm in Lakeside, Ontario, Robin at the theatre, Joe establishing his high-end restaurant, The Church in Stratford. Joe died in 2023. As for his life spent as a creative, Robin Phillips said, I think every walk of life has artists. Every walk of life is capable of beauty. The world of the imagination is hugely important. Whatever I do, I must not diminish the imagination, but I must allow it to expand. I believe deeply that art and faith are the same thing. Once your head is capable of becoming it, and your heart is capable of embracing it, you can go anywhere. Heron Karvik. Heron Karvik, who plays the voice of Morpho in The Velvet Web, was born Geoffrey Richard William Harris on the 21st of January 1913. 
He was educated at Eton, but ran away to France in order to escape from the life imagined for him by his father. He began to carve out a living for himself and adopted the name Heron Carvick as it derived from that of his grandmother and would avoid bringing scandal to the doorstep of his outraged family. He began his stage career there in cabaret, appearing at the Casino de Paris alongside the Folie Bergère. When he was 23, he met Phyllis Nielsen Terry, who was 20 years his senior. Phyllis, daughter of the actor Fred Terry and so the cousin of John Gielgud, was from the third generation of the illustrious theatrical dynasty and enjoyed early success in the classics. Heron and Phyllis didn't actually marry until 1958, the year her first husband, actor Cecil King, died, but they <clears throat> collaborated theatrically well before that. When he returned to the UK, Heron Carvick found himself in a number of musical comedies in London. In the mid-30s, he was plying his trade as a theatre actor in the UK, taking in five rep companies, four West End productions, and a season under Lillian Bayliss at the Old Vic. In 1937, he was at the Embassy Theatre London in a revival of The Bat, and also made an impression on audiences in Somerset at the Wells Drama Festival when playing the poet in George Bernard Shaw's Candida. He appeared with Phyllis in Twelfth Night in Cheltenham in 1938, also playing opposite his own sister, Teresa, which made them convincing twins and so helped the piece's mistaken identity wheeze. And he played Professor Higgins in Pygmalion at Amersham. It's a role he'd play again in 1943. In 1939, he and Phyllis entered into a business partnership with their first production of a light comedy, Then and Again, starring them both, opening in Norwich before heading to Manchester, Cardiff and the West End. The Western Mail described Carvick as an ambitious and talented artiste of whom great things are expected. But talking of great things, it was in 1939 that Heron was in Gerald Savory's George and Margaret. More of this when we get to the Celestial Toymaker, at the Hackney Empire. During the war, Heron entertained British troops as part of an Ensor tour, but he was writing too, and he and Phyllis celebrated the easing off of the conflict by appearing together in his own piece, a new play called The Widow at Forty, which toured for a year. This was followed by another collaboration, The Beggar's Union, which had texts and songs from Carvick's pen, all uttered out loud by Phyllis. He also won good notices touring as an actor only in Patrick Hamilton's disturbing play Gaslight, in which he played the key role of the cruel husband. He also spent much of the 1940s on the radio, including playing Kefas in the controversial Dorothy L. Sayers play cycle The Man Born to be King about the life of Christ, which created something of a storm. But it was just one of many broadcasts. The sheer number participated in by Carvick made his name, if not his versatile voice, hugely recognisable to the nation's millions of wireless listeners. By 1951, it was estimated that he had 500 radio performances under his belt, including playing Bluebeard in St Joan a decade earlier. But 1951 was when he debuted in another medium, television. In St Joan again, this time visually, and this time playing the Dauphin. He appeared on television sporadically throughout the next decade, often playing French men, such as in 1954's Gravel Hanger and 1957's The Tale of Two Cities. And in 1961, he played five in the Avengers episode Square Root of Evil. Doctor Who, however, was to be his last TV credit. He doesn't seem to have been that worried. His photo, as far as we can ascertain, never appeared in the casting directory spotlight. He was seemingly getting jobs on the strength of his radio and voice reputation alone. But that's because radio was very much his home. His performance as Gandalf in the BBC's 1969 Lord of the Rings still has life today, and in 1975 he revisited the Christ story, playing Kefas again when A Man Born to be King was remounted. Two other original cast members, John Laurie and the Daleks Alan Wheatley, joined him. To list his radio credits would probably extend this podcast's running time beyond the projected survival of a good percentage of its listeners, so shall we just say there were lots and he was hugely respected within the profession for his voice work. But that wasn't enough for Heron Carvick, because he also made an impact on the literary world with his Mrs. Seaton books. 
retired art teacher Emily Seaton is a heroine he created in 1968. A genteel lady who finds herself embroiled in charming mystery stories. Stylistically, an affectionate spoof of Agatha Christie's Miss Marple. He wrote five Seaton books in all, from the first, Picture Mrs Seaton, to the last, Odds on Mrs Seaton, in 1975. After the couple had been living quietly in an old farmhouse in Kent for nearly 20 years, Phyllis died aged 84 in 1977, and at around this time, Heron stopped his radio work. In August 1979, he was observed and heard driving his car at speed and creating a loud scraping sound as he did so. Some minutes later, he was found semi-conscious in the vehicle, which had crashed into the ditch on a tight corner of the road he was travelling along in Lee Green, Tenderton. His sister Teresa said she thought he had been heading to hers to return her handbag, which she had left at his house, having visited him earlier. Travelling at high speed with a flat tyre had caused it to shred and for him to lose control of the vehicle. He never fully recovered, and despite an operation and a period in intensive care, Helen Karvik eventually died of pneumonia in hospital on the 9th of February 1980. He was 67. Rather wonderfully, though, since his death, Mrs. Seaton has prevailed. When Karvik's novels were reissued in the US, they were so successful that his estate commissioned further adventures for Miss Seaton. First, in 1990, Roy Peter Martin wrote three novels using the nom de plume Hampton Charles. And then Sarah J. Mason, writing as Hamilton Crane, took up the series and at the time of recording has released 16 of the books, the latest in 2018. You'll note that in a nod to their originator, both pseudonyms bear the initials HC. For many years, the one photograph featured online purporting to be the only available image of Heron Karvik was not actually of him. Fortunately, the geek behind the voice you are currently listening to was able to find an actual image of Karvik in 2020, and others have been traced by Clayton Hickman and Twitter's Mestor the Magnificent. They will be used to accompany this podcast on its Patreon page, but on a section that is accessible to all. We're not the holding things to ransom types here. Pleasingly, with his elongated, slightly pointed features, Heron Karvik looks rather like you'd expect someone called Heron should. But perhaps it's even more appropriate that this doyen of the wireless should have lingered more as a voice than as a face. And so ends another episode of Doctor Who. Already the Keys of Marinus feels very different from what's gone before, although you could reasonably argue that that's true of every story up to this point in Doctor Who's short history. But the structure of the serial, with each Saturday introducing a brand new menace that is, for all intents and purposes, completely independent of the peril faced the week before, very much distinguishes the journey across Marinus from the preceding travels through Cathay and the wilderness of Scarrow. In the span of just two episodes, we've shifted from high adventure, exploring a mysterious island infested with traps and lurking monsters, to psychological terror, as Barbara is first isolated from her friends and then hunted by them. The Velvet Web sets out the entire story's mission statement for the viewer. Don't get too comfortable because... Just when you think you've got the Keys of Marinus figured out, everything's going to change with a twist of a travel dial. And if that sounds familiar, it's because it's the Doctor Who mission statement in miniature. Just replace travel dial with TARDIS control and possibly twist with push, slide or malfunction. But you get the idea. Of course, the downside of this done-in-one approach, and the reason why Doctor Who wouldn't really embrace it until the 21st century, by which time narrative economy was a very different thing than in 1964, is that there's precious little time each week to set up the new situation. It's hard to deny that the Velvet Web is pretty thin plot-wise, and that's neither the first nor the last time we'll level that accusation at an instalment of The Keys of Marinus. 
But three things help to lift the episode beyond simply being a stock sci-fi scenario into which the Doctor, Susan, Ian and Barbara have been casually inserted. The first is that John Gorry, who played things pretty safe on The Sea of Death last week, finally gets some moments to shine this time around. Not everything works, but the scene of Barbara waking up to discover the truth about Morphoton is particularly glorious, thrusting the viewer into the same jarring sense of altered reality that the schoolteacher is also experiencing. Gorry's decision to underplay the sequence lends it a wonderful edge of discomfort. He doesn't cut to an extreme close-up of the battered cup to show that it isn't really a beautiful crystal flute. He doesn't have great gaping holes worn into Altos's robes to convince us that they're different from his original regal garments. Instead, Gorry lets the viewers spot the differences, provoking a gnawing sense of realisation that echoes Barbara's thought process. Second, Terry Nation and David Whittaker wisely avoid throwing away their supporting characters, even if one of them only returns thanks to the last-minute happenstance of William Hartnell's well-earned vacation. The time spent establishing Sabitha and Altos is deserved because both characters loom larger in the overall story of the Keys of Marinus than we might at first assume. Not only are they suitably positioned for their roles within the Velvet Web, but by the end of the episode, we've already developed enough of a sense of who they are to be interested in following them through the rest of the serial. Third, and perhaps most cleverly, is the way that the script toys with our expectations of how this kind of adventure will play out. The first few minutes clearly signpost Ian as the hero of the day, which is pretty much the role he's played since Doctor Who began. He's the one who finds Barbara's blood-spattered travel dial. He's the one who notices Altos's infrequent blinking. He's the one who wonders what price they'll have to pay for the luxury being foisted upon them by the denizens of Morphoton. And that's some lovely dialogue for him there too. Barbara, on the other hand, is the patsy. She's the first person duped by the mesmeron, the one who invites her friends to share in the city's generosity while downplaying Ian's concerns. It looks like we're conforming to stereotypical 60s gender roles. Ian is the man whose pragmatism helps him see through the con, while Barbara is the woman, beguiled by pretty baubles. That's what makes the mid-episode twist, with Barbara shaking off the malign influence of the Morphos and Ian, completely brainwashed, so wonderfully effective. If it were Ian hiding in the cellar, we wouldn't be too concerned. But Barbara? Well, the script has just spent ten minutes emphasising her helplessness and victimhood. What can she possibly accomplish on her own? With the benefit of hindsight, of course, we know what a capable woman Jacqueline Hill would establish Barbara to be. But in April 1964, we weren't quite there yet, and the Velvet Web helps to plant those seeds. The Velvet Web also does something that is Doctor Who in a nutshell. It presents us with something weird, dissonant, familiar and yet skewed, something that is an inherently funny juxtaposition of the real and the bizarre, and it plays it straight without winking at the audience. The scene in which the Doctor praises the glories of his new laboratory while standing in a blank, featureless room is disorienting and strange, and then, when he's eulogising the quality of the device he has in his hands, which we can see is not only a tin mug but a rusty, dirty one, the scene is all of those things, but it's quirky and it's funny too. It could also serve as a metaphor for the show, that scene. Indeed, for television of the time, which often had to present the wonders of the universe with the humblest of means, forcing the viewers to do the rest of the work with their minds. Now, it would be too far to suggest that this is deliberately meta, but perhaps we can allow it to become so 60-odd years later. And even if you choose for it not to, then surely just as a scene, it's judged perfectly and works within its own terms, with Hartnell and Russell playing it blithely and letting the peculiarity, the strangeness, the incongruity of the situation speak for itself. And then there is the title. What a beautiful metaphor for our ability to be ensnared by trinkets, to be subdued by comfort, perhaps even to be enslaved by our own desires maybe even capitalism itself, which is, is it not, the ultimate velvet web. Oh, and 
this is where we pay the bill. Doctor Who, The Velvet Web, featured Heron Karvik as the voice of Morpho. The title music was by Ron Grainer at the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. The incidental music was by Norman Kay. The story editor was David Whittaker. The designer, Raymond P. Cusick. And the associate producer was Mervyn Pinfield. Coming next, on screen, a principal Doctor Who cast member is completely missing from an entire episode for the very first time. And it's none other than the Doctor himself. But there's drama behind the scenes too, as Doctor Who faces the thorny charge of plagiarism. That's next time on Doctor Who, Too Much Information. Next episode, The Screaming Jungle. Or it's less Raiders of the Lost Ark and more Raiders of the Lost Park. Too Much Information, The Velvet Web, was presented by me, Toby Haydock, from a script I co-wrote with Shannon Patrick Sullivan. Additional voice work was provided by Chrissy Bone and Shirley Houston, with thanks to Richard Bignall, David Brunt, Peter Crocker and Mestor the Magnificent. The series consultant is Richard Bignall, and the music has been specially composed by Wayne Shepherd. Before we go, it's probably worth going into a little more detail about the missing fragments of the Velvet Web referred to throughout this podcast. They all occur around VT edits, which often cause off-locks, picture breakups on the film recordings, due to loss of sync, which can last between a few frames and a second or more. Film recordings would always be reviewed for such problems using a cutting copy. Problems would then be edited out in such a way that the narrative was unaffected, hence sometimes losing an entire line, but more usually just the picture disturbance, and those cuts subsequently made to the negative. Any subsequent prints made would have the edits, but be a single roll of film suitable for sale and broadcast. The second film recording made on the 20th of April 1967 would have used the same edit list, possibly so that a magnetic soundtrack then in existence could be reused. That, I think, is what they call the science bit, and with thanks to Peter Crocker from the restoration team for that information. There is a supplemental podcast, one per story as opposed to per episode, far too much information that is now for exclusive use of patrons, and they also qualify for bonus material, early releases and other exclusives as well as pictures of my dog. Patrons are also nearly six months ahead with my Happy Times and Places podcast, so if you want to hear artist Connor J. Atkins celebrate the greatest show in the galaxy, or clever man and high-end columnist John Ellidge wax lyrical about World Enough and Time and The Doctor Falls, then head to patreon.com forward slash Toby Haydoke. References Too much information would, of course, contain far too little information if it weren't for the wealth of original scripts and production paperwork that has been unearthed and collated over the years. My debt to those responsible for this Herculean effort is beyond description. The production subtitles on BBC Video's DVD of The Keys of Marinus, written by Richard Molesworth, are a treasure trove of insight and information. The earliest days of Doctor Who are chronicled by a small library of splendid reference works, from Jeremy Bentham's pioneering Doctor Who The Early Years to the titanic tag team of Doctor Who The Sixties and Doctor Who The Handbook The First Doctor by David J. Howe, Mark Stammers and Stephen James Walker, and culminating in Doctor Who The Complete History Volume 2, edited by John Ainsworth. The Complete History, which as a series is also edited by Mark Wright, boasts contributions from Jonathan Morris, Richard Atkinson and Alistair McGowan, and of course, it builds upon the archives published in Doctor Who magazine and written by Andrew Pixley. The archive for the Keys of Marinus can be found in issue 310, with updates in the seventh instalment of the Doctor Who magazine special edition. Also a vital resource in the pages of Doctor Who magazine is the fact of fiction for which Jonathan Morris studied the Keys of Marinus in issue 445. 
and a discussion of relevant periodicals cannot end without an acknowledgement of that premier magazine of Doctor Who research, Richard Bignall's Nothing at the End of the Lane. Oscar-winning filmmaker Hubert Davis's Move Your Mind from the National Film Board of Canada is a great insight into the artistic mind of Robin Phillips, whose life has been written about well by The Guardian's Michael Coveney and Martin Morrow in Canada's Globe and Mail. I also access online repositories of British and international newspapers for contemporary reviews, interviews and listings. Occupying its corner of the World Wide Web for 28 years and counting is Doctor Who, A Brief History of Time, open brackets, travel, close brackets. There, Shannon Patrick Sullivan provides another account of the making of the Keys of Marinus, although this one is rather more, well, brief, as it says on the tin. I walk in the shadows of giants, giants whom I may occasionally dare to correct, but always very politely, because they're right far, far more often than they're wrong. Plus, what with them being giants and me, well, not being one, they could squash me like the bug that I am. I'm grateful to the patrons who support this and all of my other podcasts, and they include Ruben Herfindel, Scott Sherritt, Darcy Smart, John Bull, Peter Chamberlain, James Kersey, Bill Evanson, Brandon Moore, Peter Kelly, Stephen Waters, David Workman, Peter Burns, James Curray Smith, Peter Harness, Ronald Hayden, Rob Leonard, Christopher Meredith, Gavin McLean, Richard Straw, Neil Tate, Nick Tedston, Tim Arding, Nigel Bromley, Paul Cook, Richard Chalk, Grant Davidson, John Deere, Chris Dunford Kelk, Paul Dunn, Jason Gorman, Siobhan Galichon, Paul Harris, Chris Hyam, Ian Key, Joe Llewellyn, Ian K. McLachlan, Philip Marsh, Nathan Martin, Roland Moore, Rick Moran, Kevin Murdoch, Graham Knott, Adam Parker, Barry Platt, Risto Matti Sarillo, Frank Shales, James Lark, Lisa and Andrew, Gavin McLean, Steve Manfred, David Matthewman, Jason Mayo, and Stephen Moffat. would you like your name read out on the credits? Well, that's one of the many bonuses of being a patron of these endeavours. Find out more at patreon.com forward slash Toby Haydock. There, for as little as £3 a month, you are able to get advance releases, bonus material, pictures of my dog. You'd have got this particular podcast a couple of months early. The Happy Times and Places podcasts are about six months earlier. And you also get behind the scenes snoops at any sort of DVD documentaries I might have done or events, uh, interviews with Doctor Who personnel and all sorts of other goodies as well as the most popular corner of my Patreon, which is pictures of my dog. Well, he's a very nice chap. So that's patreon.com forward slash Toby Haydoke, where you get a 10% discount if you sign up for a year in one go. There are other ways of supporting without having to commit to monthly payments. You can go to ko-fi.com forward slash Toby Haydock and give a one-off donation any time something's particularly tickled your fancy. Or if you want to do the bit that doesn't cost anything, that's absolutely fine. I'm just grateful you've listened. In fact, I'm even more grateful if you're listening this far in because, you know, the fun's over. If there was any fun, the scrutiny is over. The pedantry is over. The dissection of minutiae is over. This is just the begging bowl bit. But uh, look, you don't need to put anything of any worth to you that, that costs you anything into my metaphorical bowl. All you have to do is go to iTunes, Apple, Podbean, Spotify, anywhere that you digest these things and give them a five-star review and perhaps a few lines of description about what it is you like about them and uh, recommend them to other people because that really helps to separate these from the crowd and there are quite a few Doctor Who podcasts out there I don't know if you've noticed so any support via the medium of cyberspace is much appreciated I'm on Twitter at Toby Haydoke these podcasts have their own feed at Haydoke Podcasts and I have a Facebook page and I'm on Instagram at Toby.Haydoke so uh, if you haven't had enough of me already for having just listened to me forever then uh, there's more now go, now go. Now go.